morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the material because I don't want to run over. I would like very much to get through it and give you chances to ask questions. So I'm just going to jump right in. So tonight we are going to discuss why talking about stroke is important. We're going to talk about different types of stroke and what is it? What are the risk factors? What are the things that cause a stroke? And then very importantly, what are signs of stroke? Because I want you all to know that if you have signs of stroke or a family or friend has signs of stroke, I need you to call 911 right away. We're gonna look at treatment options for stroke and then we're gonna wrap up with a little bit about COVID and stroke because that's the hot topic lately. So when you think of stroke, you should think of the brain. However, I wanna start out with something uh, a little on a broader scale. I want you to think of what we're talking about tonight as the vascular system, all the arteries and veins in your body. And so when we're, we're gonna focus tonight on the brain and that would be your cerebral vascular system right here. And then the cardiovascular system, I guess you would figure that out as the heart. And then the peripheral vascular system is in your legs and your arms. And this is where you can have peripheral vascular disease. So here's for the brain attack or for patients that have cerebral vascular disease, plaque or blood clots in the larger or the small arteries of the brain or in the carotid artery. And here's your carotid artery right here. And you can see here, there's some stenosis where it gets real tiny. Or if we blow this up, you can see plaque along here. And you can see here where the blood clots might start migrating. And if they migrate, they go straight up to the brain. And this is where you have your stroke. Here are signs and symptoms of stroke. It's BFAST is the acronym I want you to remember. And BALANCE, we'll go over this again in a little bit as well, but I want to go over it a couple times. So the signs of stroke can be trouble being dizzy or being off balance. Uh, you can have visual field cuts or problem seeing, blurred vision. Half of your face, your, your smile will be crooked. That's very, very common is a very good crooked smile. If you smile and one side doesn't go up, that's a sign of a stroke. Here, if your arm or leg are weak or numb, usually on one side of the body, definitely a stroke. If you have problems speaking or understanding speech, or your speech comes out very slurred, that would be a definite sign of a stroke as well. And then the time is you need to call 911. A stroke is a medical emergency and you need to call 911. Out of this whole evening, I want you to remember that. Stroke is a medical emergency. If you have any of these signs, you don't need to have all of them. If you have any of these signs, then you would be having a stroke and you need to call 911. You'll see the faster you get to us at the hospital, the better chance you have of us reversing the stroke. So the next one in our vascular system is our cardiovascular system. And if you have problems with your cardiovascular system or your, it's your heart, but the same types of things happen. You can get plaque or clots in these coronary arteries that wrap around your heart and feed the heart muscle. But you know what happens when you have a heart attack? This, this guy over here, he's in a lot of pain. Heart attacks hurt, strokes do not. Most strokes, especially ischemic strokes or a blockage stroke, there's no pain involved. You have just the symptoms, your arm gets weak, your speech gets slurred, but you don't, you don't always get a headache. You might get a headache it's if, a, if it's a hemorrhagic stroke. We'll talk a little bit more about all of those. This is peripheral vascular and you can see it's the vascular or the vessels in your legs and the exact same thing can happen. You can have plaque buildup where the blood can't get through or this plaque can crack and make little blood clots that can go to your legs. And oftentimes you can get a deep um, uh, venous thrombosis or a clot down in your legs that um, can be very painful. That part can hurt. So what do we do? What do we do to prevent a stroke? And basically we need to know 
our risks, what is it about each of us, ourselves personally, that put us at higher risk for stroke or heart disease or peripheral vascular disease? They're all very tied together. And then we need to know how to decrease our risk. And in a nutshell over here, you know, get active, drink a lot of water, eat fruits and vegetables, get up and get moving again and let, you know, eat healthy snacks. Basically, you need to live a healthy lifestyle, know the signs of stroke. And if anyone yourself or anyone has signs of stroke, what do you do? I'm used to an interactive audience. You call 911. So what's an ischemic stroke? An ischemic stroke right here, ischemic stroke is a blockage. So if this, here's your, your carotid artery again, if there's plaque or clot there and it flows up into your brain and blocks this artery and causes a stroke, that's an ischemic stroke, okay? And it's a blockage kind of stroke from either clots or from plaque. So you can see if I showed you in the pipes, this would be an example of a blood clot sitting in your artery. So your, your artery is the pipe, and these are nice clean pipes, but you have a blood clot. Now these pipes now are not so clean. This is where you would have, this was, if this was your artery, you're full of plaque. And so it's, the, it's getting smaller and smaller in here, and that's where a clot could form. So you can see, you can have a combination over here where you just, it gets smaller and smaller as you go up until it's completely occluded. So that's what a blocked stroke looks like. Now, one type of a blocked stroke or one of the most common types comes from having something called atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is where the two atria of your heart right here, where they fibrillate and they shake like this and the blood doesn't pump out like it's supposed to and it makes little clots. And when those little clots are bouncing around in your heart, and the heart is beating kind of erratically, all it takes is one of those little clots to go up and get up into your brain. And you can see here, here's my little arrow, the clot can come up, here's your aorta on the top of your heart, your ventricle pump, and it pumps the blood that possibly could have a clot in it, and it goes straight up to your brain and right here into this artery, and there's your stroke in that area of your brain. So that's called an emboli, or it's an ischemic stroke, just a very common type of ischemic stroke that's caused from an irregular heartbeat. Now I told you there was a couple different kinds of stroke. The other kind of stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke or a bleeding kind of stroke. So it's just like if your pipes were to rupture and this would be the blood that's spilling out. If you have bleeding in the smaller vessels inside of the tissue of your brain, it's called an intracerebral hemorrhage and there's a blood clot inside the brain tissue. And then if you have an aneurysm, a cerebral aneurysm, that's an outpouching like this on an artery that's in your brain, usually on the larger arteries. And if that ruptures, you get something called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Both of these can cause very severe headaches. Um, usually these also will cause you to have a decreased level of consciousness. You just won't be awake. Um, these are much more serious. The hemorrhagic strokes are usually much more serious. So this is a CAT scan. You can see the difference. The hemorrhagic stroke is actually, I'm sorry, the subarachnoid hemorrhage here is a hemorrhagic stroke, but it's, it's bleeding around the brain. So this is blood that is in between either all of the lobes of the brain. So there's not really blood in the inside the brain tissue, but it's around the brain and it causes all kinds of trouble. In this picture over here, this is a hemorrhagic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage in the brain tissue. There's swelling around it here called edema. And you can see this is pushing the whole brain over to the side. Here's the middle. And if you come down the middle, this should be right here in the middle. So as you come down the middle, these are ventricles, the whole side of the brain is being pushed over and we call that a midline shift. And that's the reason sometimes to go to the operating room and try and take this out because this is gonna cause damage to your whole brain. Here's where aneurysms come from. 
in the larger arteries. They're this out pouching. Usually at the, at where one artery comes together at another artery, you get these little aneurysms. This one is an angiogram with a, a basilar artery in the back of the brain. There's a basilar tip artery. So they, uh, they rupture and they cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now to treat these, this is your aneurysm here and this is your artery. We would do this um, via your groin. We would go into the femoral artery, go all the way up to the brain. And we would insert these wires, these tiny little wires about the size of a hair. And we would fill up these aneurysms. And these aneurysms are usually around seven or eight millimeters. Um, so they're pretty tiny, but you fill them up. You fill them up with the, uh, the coils until you can shoot some dye across here and no dye goes into the aneurysm. That makes it secure, it shouldn't rupture, and it shouldn't bleed anymore. Another option to treat an aneurysm is to clip. When you do an aneurysm clip, you take um, the skull off and it's a big open, open craniotomy. They go in kind of try to go underneath this temporal lobe here. They get up inside to get to those tiny little aneurysms and they put a clip on them. And it depends on what kind of aneurysms they are as to what kind of treatment we would do. Now let's move into a transient ischemic attack. So a TIA means, I've heard them called a mini stroke, but in all honesty, a TIA means that you got lucky and you didn't have a stroke. So the TIA, it means that you're starting to have an ischemic event or, or a, um, an ischemic stroke, but then for some reason that clot dissolves and you start flowing back to that area of your brain and so your symptoms go away. They usually resolve in 15 minutes or so, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, it's similar to like if you're going up, up steps and you, um, get some chest pain and you sit down and rest and your chest pain goes away. This would be like that only in your brain. And now I'm gonna show you this video of, of someone having a stroke or having, I'm sorry, having a TIA. There you go. How pretty was that? Not bad, but not half as pretty as this. Well, bring it on. Uh, oh my, if the old folks' home is looking for a ringer, look no further. I'm in the prime of my life, I'll have you know. And these are your genes too, pal. Let's take a good long look at your future, huh? Well, I don't know about my future, but uh, I think I can see my reflection. Such disrespect. <laughs> Come on, free shot. I bet you can't make it from here. Look at his what, right arm. afraid of losing our bet? Watch his right arm. Now listen to his feet. Dad, are you okay? Dad. There's the clot. Stop the blood flow. Look, let's sit down, okay? In the area that controls his arm and his feet. Now going, going away. away. <laughs> what was that? I mean, one second you're fine and the next you're all limp. I'm not sure. My hand went a little numb and I, I couldn't seem to get any words out. <laughs> but I feel fine now. Well, we're still not playing. Oh, sure. We got to finish. No, Dad, sit down. Something just happened to you. I'm calling for help. You've just watched someone have a mini stroke, sometimes called a TIA, or transient ischemic attack. A TIA is a serious medical condition that indicates blood flow to the brain has been interrupted, usually because of a temporary blood clot in a person's artery. What are the warning signs of a TIA? Well, as you've just seen, a person may suddenly feel weakness, numbness, or heaviness, even in a small part of the body, like the hand, face, or foot. It may be hard to speak or understand words, Things may look blurry or dim, and a person might feel dizzy or clumsy on their feet. You might also experience a sudden headache that feels like a severe migraine. 
Symptoms might last a few hours or only a few minutes, but a TIA is a serious medical condition regardless of how long the symptoms last. It's your body's way of warning you that you're at risk of having a stroke. Just like chest pains can warn of an impending heart attack, a TIA can warn of an impending brain attack, which is why we also want you to think of TIA as take immediate action. If you or someone you know experiences any of these symptoms, call 911 or get to the hospital immediately. The minutes you save could also save a life. So now there was a good example of a TIA. And what did the guy do? He says, well, I'm fine now. Let's go back and play basketball. And that is not the right answer. Uh, but that's what happens very, very often. If you have these types of symptoms, this you, your risk of having a stroke 10% within 48 hours, 20% within three months. So really, if you have those symptoms, I think you should go to the emergency room. At the very least, you call your physician and tell him that you just had these symptoms and he, you need to come and see him and he should either tell you to go to the emergency room or he should come um, and uh, have you come into his office and start working you up. It cannot be ignored or you'll be back in with us having a full stroke where the symptoms don't go away. It's very scary and often strokes are led by a TIA. So what causes a stroke? What, what causes a stroke with all of us? So here's a risk, uh, your scorecard, a risk scorecard. If you have high blood pressure, you're at a higher risk of having stroke. The higher your blood pressure is, the higher the risk is. If you have atrial fibrillation, like I showed you earlier where it beats, um, that is a very high risk. There's like five times the risk for having a stroke than normal. Being a smoker makes you an increased risk. Having high cholesterol, having diabetes, not exercising, being a couch potato is definitely increases your risk. Eating a poor diet, being overweight and eating unhealthy foods puts you at high risk. And if you have stroke in your family or even heart disease in your family, then it's not really hereditary, but it, it's familial, meaning that you will be at higher risk. If you have family that have had stroke or heart disease, then you are at higher risk for stroke and heart disease. So if you go and check these off, uh, you can see what your risks are. If you have, you're at very high risk if you have three reds. You're, if you're in the caution, you still need to be careful and reduce your risk. If you're all green, then you're doing good and uh, you're probably pretty safe. Now, there are things that you can't change like your age and more males are having strokes than females, but more females die from stroke. Um, if you are older, older people have are much higher risk for stroke, but I guarantee you it is not just about old people. We have had, I teach a pediatric stroke class. We have a pediatric stroke program here because kids have strokes for different reasons. You usually don't find a four-year-old that's smoking, but they have cardiac problems or they have other diseases that cause their blood to clot differently. And so even kids have strokes. If you look at race, African-Americans have more intracerebral hemorrhages and Asians have more subarachnoid hemorrhages. Um, Hispanics are all very high for ischemic strokes and then Caucasians all fit in there somewhere, but race plays a part as well. And as I mentioned, the family history does play a part. So these things you can't change, but there are things you can change. If you have high blood pressure, then you need to work with your physician and get it under control. And 140, you know, 140 over 80 or 140 over 90 is not okay. Even if you're 80 years old, it really isn't okay. Um, we push to get their blood pressures, our patients' blood pressures down to like 120 over 80 in the majority of the patients. Um, there are special considerations that that's why you should always work, work with your physician. Um, but you need to get your blood pressure down. And if you're on blood pressure medicine, you should be taking your blood pressure at home at least once a week and keeping track of it and looking at 
just looking at the trend, if you have one high blood pressure, but all the rest are low, it's not nothing to worry about. But if you are trending up or you trend or you tend to have higher blood pressure, you need to call your doctor. Even if you have a, an appointment in two months, you need to call your doctor and get back sooner than later. Tell them your blood pressure is too high and you need to come in and they should try some different medications. High cholesterol. Uh, if you don't know what your cholesterol is, then you need to get that lab drawn, know what your cholesterol is, and, and if it's high, you need to work on it and get it lower. For total cholesterol, we want it less than 200. For LDL, which is considered the bad cholesterol that builds up in your vessels, and then that cholesterol with a stroke patient, excuse me, we actually want them down closer to the 70s. So anything over 70, 100 is fine if you have no other issues. If you're 20 years old and it's 100, that's fine. But if your cholesterol is, is high and your blood pressure is high, we want your cholesterol to be lower. You can see what the cholesterol does to your vessels. It just makes the lumen tinier and the blood can't get through. Now, HDL is your good cholesterol. You can call the LDL lousy cholesterol and the HDL happy cholesterol but the good cholesterol helps to carry the bad cholesterol away. So you get your good cholesterol higher by exercising more and by eating healthy fats like almonds, um, salmon, mackerel. You're looking at, at good healthy fats. And cholesterol matters. Now this is a uh, something that one of my patients showed me um, the patient was the wife and the husband was the engineer. And you can see this is from 2001. I've been doing this a long time. This, this patient, uh, his, her wife, his, let's see, her husband, sorry, tracked her cholesterol. And when she got high like this, this is when she had her stroke. And so, and you know, this is 228 is her LDL. So this is really, really high. They got it under control with medication. She decided the meds were bothering her. She didn't want to take them. She stopped taking them. Her cholesterol went back up. She had another stroke. Got them back down. And then here she actually had a TIA. Um, so you, you can just see that, that it is really important to, to control your cholesterol. Now, why does diabetes increase your risk for stroke or heart disease? Well, basically what diabetes does, your, if your sugar levels in your blood are too high, it damages the small arteries in your body. So you can have problems seeing, those are very small arteries that are in your eyes, very small arteries in your brain causing a stroke. Small arteries in your heart can cause heart disease. You can have nephropathy because you have very small arteries in your kidneys that can that are filtering your blood and that can cause kidney disease. So if you ever know anybody that has very brittle diabetes or has walks around with a really high blood sugar, they often are on dialysis. They may have um, lost a leg or some toes because it doesn't they can't uh, perfuse and get blood supply down to your no, down to your toes. Uh, you can have GI dysfunction. Um, uh, urinary problems, not being able to go or not being able to control your bladder. Uh, so diabetes can be controlled if you keep your blood sugar down, then it won't cause damage to your arteries. If you walk around with uncontrolled diabe diabetes and your numbers are up in the, you know, you walk around with a 300 blood sugar every day, you're going to have problems and you're going to be at higher risk for a stroke. So cardiac disease, we talked a little bit about with the atrial fibrillation. Coronary artery disease means those, those arteries, those coronary arteries that wrap around the heart that get filled with plaque. A patent foramen ovale is a hole between the atria. And again, just like the atrial fibrillation, it can cause the blood to clot and can cause a clot to go up to your brain. And then carotid stenosis, we looked at the artery. This is the carotid artery here. If you look at me in my neck, the carotid artery, it becomes stenosed, becomes smaller because of plaque or a clot. All of that can cause uh, a stroke. The other things you can change, 
don't smoke. Tobacco use is terrible. If you have damage from high blood pressure, damage from diabetes, you light up a cigarette and your vessels constrict. Just makes everything worse. Obesity makes your vessels usually will, will retain more fat. Too much alcohol can cause liver damage and can cause a hemorrhagic stroke. Sedentary lifestyle, uh, if you don't exercise, it puts you at higher risk for stroke. So don't be this guy. Don't be the fat guy sitting on the couch. Smoking is poison. And this is, this is just a silly slide that comes off the internet, but you know, inside cigarettes, there's, there's horrible things. There, there, here we, it shows the nicotine, which is like insecticide. Here's ammonia like toilet cleaner carbon monoxide, arsenic, poison, methanes like sewer gas, all these bad things that you're putting into your lungs. So smoking is just terrible. It doesn't just hurt your lungs, it hurts your whole body. And exercise is magic. Exercise will make your cholesterol go down, your lousy cholesterol go down. It will make your happy cholesterol go up. It'll make your blood sugar go down. It'll make your blood pressure go down in the big picture. Maybe while you're exercising, your blood pressure is up a little bit, but overall it'll make your blood pressure go down. Exercise will decrease your risk of stroke. And even if maybe you've already had a stroke or, or you haven't, I have rheumatoid arthritis and I'm not a great exerciser because I have two new knees. I'm working on a new hip and a new shoulder. Well, but I still can walk some or I do something to get my heart beating faster and try to uh, and try to exercise the best I can. I can do things from my chair, raise things up, just get my blood pumping, and that really helps. Make it fun. I do a lot of swimming. That's what works for me. I used to water ski, and uh, but I was much younger. Um, but make exercise fun. Do things. Go for walks with friends. Uh, go swimming. Right now we can't do anything because we're all on lockdown, but uh, when, when we get back out, when we get free again, go out and exercise. So what are signs of stroke? We're gonna go over this again and I'm gonna keep it simple, but if you look at the brain, there are all different areas of the brain that cause different deficits. So back this back part of your brain is where you interpret vision, you interpret sight. This is where you, can hear and understand speech. Here is where you can actually find the words and speak. Here's a sensory where all your sensory comes in where you touch something hot and you feel it. This is the motor. So it makes you be able to move your arms and your legs. Um, and the frontal lobe is a lot of the thinking lobe. So depending on which artery is occluded or which artery ruptures depends on what symptoms you have. So stroke signs, this is the big one from the American Heart Association, the one that doesn't stick with the BFAST, but this is the, the long list, if you will, but sudden weakness or numbness on one side of your body, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding speech, sudden vision changes in one or both eyes, sudden trouble walking, dizziness or loss of balance, and sudden severe headache. Now, you notice the the common thread here, the sudden. When that clot sticks in that artery, you get symptoms right away. So I've literally been talking to a person before and watched them have a stroke and their face will start drooping, just like the guy in the video, their speech will become slurred. And if they're truly having a stroke and not a TIA, those symptoms will not go away. And again, what are you gonna do? You're gonna call 911 and you're gonna get in here to see us and, and hopefully we can reverse the stroke. So I keep saying to hurry up and get in here and see us. Why is everything so fast? Why do we have to treat you so fast? Well, um, for every minute that your brain is without oxygen, you lose almost 2 million neurons. You lose the synapses between um, all the neurons in your brain that make things happen, all the myelinated fibers that help you move are lost. Uh, you can lose a pea-sized piece of your brain in 12 minutes if we don't get in there and do something quickly to try and re reverse the stroke. So it's really important that you understand 
that you need to get to us quickly. Now here's the be fast. Just to go over it again, can you tell I'm pounding this into your head? I want you to know this. B is for balance, dizziness or off balance. E is for blurred vision or eyes, something's wrong with your eyes. F is a facial droop here. A is over here with a weak arm, or it could be a weak leg, or it could be just all numb, a real numb arm. Speech, again, trouble speaking or understanding speech. And then the T is for time. And the longer you wait, the bigger the stroke will be and the more damage you'll have. Now, how do we treat a stroke? If you get here within three hours and you've had an ischemic stroke or the blockage type of stroke, we're going to assume that there's a clot in there and we're going to use this drug called, it's called TPA or tissue plasminogen activator and it works like Drano. Remember the hairball in the pipe at the beginning of the presentation? Well, that's just like the clot sitting in an artery in your brain. If you inject TPA, we hope that it'll find that clot in your brain and kind of break it up and hopefully get the blood supply back to your brain. But you can see we don't give it to you after three hours because that means your brain has been without blood supply for at least three hours. And if we reperfuse or get blood to that, that dying brain, uh, you may hemorrhage. And then you have had an ischemic stroke. We opened it up and it bled into the dead brain and that's not good. We can also take you to the interventional suite and um, I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. In interventional radiology, we have special doctors that can go in there into your brain literally and pull the clot out. And, but again, the sooner the better. The longer you sit there with that clot in your brain, the longer, the more damage you're gonna have. So you gotta get to us quick. Now we do different kinds of surgeries for the different hemorrhages, I showed you that. And then the other medical management that we can do, and we do this with or without TPA, but then we try and put you on an aspirin to keep your blood just a little thinner. We check your cholesterol and get your cholesterol, put you on medication for cholesterol if needed. We look at your blood pressure, control your blood pressure. We look at your diabetes, or if you have a diabetes, we check for diabetes. So all of those things, all those risk factors that I was saying, that's how we start treating you. And we're doing this to try and prevent a second stroke. Unfortunately, if you've had one stroke, you are at high risk of having a second stroke. So it is very, very important for you to manage your, your symptoms, if you will, or manage your risk. Even if you've had one, one stroke, you need to be able to manage and try to prevent a second stroke. And then rehabilitation, I put forever. You know, the doctors will tell you that most of your rehab will happen within the first six months. And that's true, but I can tell you as strokes with my friends and my stroke survivor buddies, um, they continue doing rehab long on their own years. Um, they continue speech, they, they do different things. They try and keep moving their arms. They look for different studies. They never give up. And those are the patients that have a good quality of life even after they've had a stroke. Now here's the video where I said we could go in and pull the clot out. Let's watch this for just a couple minutes. And I'm gonna talk over this one and uh, explain to you what's going on. So this is just the company that makes it. It's called the Solitaire. We call it a stent retriever. We go in through your groin and then we come up and we're gonna find the clot. We're gonna push this wire you're gonna see the wire coming up. This is a guide wire. We're gonna try and push that wire up and it goes up into your brain. If you look over in this picture from your groin all the way up past your heart, up into your brain, we find the clot. We push the wire through the clot. And then we come up and this is the, um, we call it the, the one of the catheters that we put in. So that's going through the clot. And then he's gonna pull the guide wire out. There's the guide wire. And then they're gonna move the stent forward. 
So they'll push the stent and we call it a stent retriever because we don't leave the stent in. We use the stent to pull the clot out. So you can see the stent goes through the clot, then they pull the catheter back. It's gonna pull the catheter back and the stent opens up and it embeds itself in the clot. And you can see that it has started to flow. Blood has started to flow again. Uh-oh, don't do that. I need to keep my hands, there we go. So after the blood starts flowing, then we will push the catheter back up. We're gonna deploy a little balloon right there. And as we deploy the balloon, it stops the forward blood flow while we pull the clot out. And we're suctioning blood at the same time as we're pulling the clot out. And then we push the balloon down and it'll reperfuse that area of the brain. Not all hospitals can do this, so you need to find where your closest comprehensive stroke center is wherever you wherever you live um, and most counties i'm assuming riverside does this as well but most counties will divert stroke patients to a an appropriate stroke center so what's the best way to treat a stroke well don't have one to begin with about 80 percent of strokes can be prevented if you live the healthy lifestyle, control any heart disease, keep your blood pressure under control, control your diabetes, don't smoke and exercise. You are going to have a low risk for a stroke. It's about choices. So go to the beach and run around and look like these people. Don't do this this morning. The doctor walks in and wanted to know what to do with these two boxes of Krispy Kreme donuts for the nurses and I told him to take them away from me and go down the hall for the other nurses that uh, in the break room where they can have them. So don't eat, your, don't eat your donuts, try and keep moving and exercise and decrease your risk for stroke. So you wanna know your weight, you know your numbers. You wanna know your weight, you wanna know your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugar, change your lifestyle, know your numbers um, and be as healthy as you can and try to prevent any kind of a stroke. Now I was asked to put in something about COVID. And this is a hot topic right now, of course. Um, I'm still at work right now. We have so many COVID patients as most hospitals do. Um, our COVID patients are not all old people either. They are younger people. Um, everybody knows or most people understand that COVID affects your lungs most of the time. And um, this is a chest X-ray of someone with COVID and you can just see all the white. I've heard it, this is a CAT scan of someone with COVID and I've heard this referred to as looking like broken glass. So these are what lungs look like of somebody that has COVID. However, what we have found is that COVID has a tendency to cause your blood to clot more. And so we are seeing some very young people come in with very large strokes that are, they have no other risk factors other than we test them. We test every patient that comes in, every stroke patient that comes in for COVID. And um, we're finding a, a, an amount of patients that come in that are having strokes. We're having inpatient code strokes in the patients that come in with COVID that are here for COVID and hadn't had a stroke yet, but while they're here in the hospital, their blood thickens because of the COVID and they may have an ischemic stroke. So this is from the Washington Post. I could have made a hundred slides about this. There's so much information out there, but young and middle-aged people that are barely sick, even with COVID are dying of strokes. Um, these doctors sound the alarm about patients in their 30s and 40s left debilitated or dead and some did not even know that they had COVID. They came in with a large stroke and we found that they were COVID positive. So if you look over here, COVID can cause blood clots. It causes abnormal clotting, not just in your head though. So it can cause strokes, but you can also get clots in your heart or in your lungs that cause, it's called a pulmonary emboli. 
You can also get clots in your heart. And so your increase of risk for a heart attack if you have COVID or an MI, a myocardial infarction is also a heart attack. Um, and then there's something called ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that's what you see here. Basically your lungs are kind of whited out and, um, and this time it's caused from COVID. So I think that's all I have. And I've left you 17 minutes for questions. Alina, thank you. What questions do we have? Thank you so much. First of all, that was a lot of information, but a lot of great information, especially the videos and just getting um, the visual representation of. Yeah, I like I do. like pictures. <laughs> I'm, excuse yeah, me. I love it. I love I like it. Pictures, yeah. <laughs> so, if you um, do have any questions, please you can go ahead and put them in the chat right now. Um, or the Q and A, and thank you for touching on um, obviously what's what's going on right now. And I know that's um, kind of top of everybody's mind, but I, I appreciate. Um, well, so I actually had a question, and, and one thing I wanted to know from you. So I know you touched on um, you know some of the things that could be done: the healthy eating, exercising. Um, and my question is this, so how much does stress management play into that? Because, you know, it's, here we are in December um, and things are, we're getting a glimmer of hope, but things are still really stressful, right? So um, for somebody that either maybe checks some of those marks, which I really like that scorecard that you shared, um, but somebody that's high there or just somebody maybe that's already had a stroke, how does stress ma management tie in? Well, there's a lot of research going on with stress and strokes and stress and inflammation in general. And so stress causes or stressful situations can cause increased and an increased inflammatory response in your body. And, and um, increased inflammation can cause some clotting that can, that can also cause the stroke. So, there's no direct Im immediate correlation saying that stress is going to do this. Um, some stress is good. You know, I know I work a little better under pressure and I get things done right at the end because I'm a little stressful. That kind of stress is okay. But, you know, I, I was saying last week, my mental health wasn't great. I was letting everything get to me. Um, I felt just horrible all week. I worked, but I was wasn't a physical horribleness. It was a out of control kind of thing. And I really worked hard to try and get that under control so that I can, I can continue to, to work and help people and do what I need to do. Um, stress is tough to control. So what I do, so, so to answer your question, yes, stress can cause not just a stroke, but can cause cardiac disease um, and and anxiety and so many other things. Um, but I, I, what I try and do is to be very mindful and be in the moment. Even if I'm in a, having a stressful moment, I'll take a minute to take some deep breaths and calm down. And then when I get home, I try and meditate. And I just really try and focus on my breathing and bringing my shoulders down and relaxing and trying to get myself unstressed out. Um, that's that's my best answer for stress and stroke. <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do have a question from Linda, and she wants to know, um, are there any vitamins that somebody can take to help to not get strokes or maybe um, lower inflammation, just kind of general? So I, I, I will touch on this kind of generally. Thanks for the question, Linda. I appreciate that. Um, I will speak on what I know, but I am not an expert in vitamins. That's when I usually get my nutrition person to come and speak when I do conferences. So um, you'll have to let Alina know to get you a nutrition expert, and then you can ask those questions. But I'll tell you what I do know. Uh, as far as vitamins go, uh, my cholesterol, I have a physician that put me on fish oils. And there's a couple reasons. The fish oils help my joints because of my rheumatoid arthritis, but 
um, I have the best cholesterol I you can take. I mean, I've just have I have like a kid's cholesterol, and I think it's because I'm taking the fish oils. Other vitamins, off the top of my head, there really there really isn't anything magic, and. I, I want to stress, though, that if you're going to dabble in vitamins or supplements or anything, you have to work with your physician because sometimes the supplements can interact with your medications. And so there, I'm, I'm a firm believer in my supplements, but I also go to my nutritionist and she puts me on something. And then I go to my primary care physician and we talk about it and make sure that there's nothing that's interacting there that could hurt me. Because, for example, fish oil they have to take you off the of fish oil before you have surgery because fish oil makes your blood thinner. So oh. it can help your cholesterol and it might actually prevent a stroke, but if you have a weak vessel and you rupture your vessel and you're on fish oil, you're actually gonna bleed more. And so you really have to be careful with the supplements um, and make sure that you discuss those either with a, a dietitian or a nutrition specialist and your physician. And physicians are not very good at supplements, but they, they're good at their medicines. So they, they put those together and, and then they can figure it out. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. Um, she, she mentioned that she does take fish oils, omega um, mm -hmm. supplements, and um, she does talk to her doctors about that. So thank good. you. And then and I, I take the omegas too, Linda. I think that's good too. <laughs> but that's good to know. I, I, I had no clue personally that, you know, that certain supplements you need to come off of before surgery. I mean, I guess that makes a lot of sense, but I wouldn't have think, thought of that. Um, and then I, I, an additional question is, so what would you say to the person that maybe right now, this year especially, is not very active? Um, they're not eating the best. Again, stress on stress. Maybe they're a caregiver um, and they're not doing a lot. Like when we say um, exercising or, or you say, you know, get moving, how little or much could that look like for them to get started? So the American Heart and Stroke Association recommend 30 minutes a day or at least five days a week. So that doesn't mean you have to jog three miles in that 30 minutes. Um, like I told you earlier, I shared that I don't get around all that great sometimes. My feet hurt so bad by the time I walk to my car. So I, I, I do little things. Um, I bought a video and it's got a little dance. I like to dance. And so it's just got some nice, easy little back and forth step dancing on it. And I like the music. It keeps me moving. It goes by fast and I'm moving. And if I need to stop and sit down for a minute to rest my feet or whatever, I do. But 30 minutes a day for about five days a week, uh, it doesn't have to even all be at the same time. You can do little 10 minute pieces, you know. Um, I see, I saw somebody sitting outside this morning on a bench. And I don't know what she was waiting for, but she was sitting down and then she'd stand up and then she'd sit down and then she'd stand up. And she did, she did it like 10 or 15 times while I was waiting for the elevator. How sad is that? Um, but... There's little things that you can do. You just got to keep moving. You have to keep moving. Great. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. So um, if there aren't any other questions right now, like I said, so this will be uh, going up on our YouTube channel and we'll send this out to along with the slide deck, which I think is so important because um, you put a lot of great stuff in there, Angie, thank the you. videos as well. Um, I've never seen I guess so realistically what that looks like with with a quote unquote mini stroke so that's good that's great to have um yeah but i will go ahead and, at that and just um thank you so much angie for your time first of all thank you for for everything you do you've really dedicated um so much of your life to this so thank you so much and for any of our support group members i'm sure if um there's any questions that come to mind afterwards i can put you in touch with Angie. Um, but we thank you so much. And I, I hope that you um, stay healthy and, and take care. So. Thank you. While I have you all here, though, I do want to plug. So I uh, am part of a support group down here. And I, I should have put the information in the presentation and I forgot until just now. Um, but I will send it to Alina and I'll send her, her our uh, 
our brochure and it'll sh it will be able to share. We do a stroke support group uh, here in Long Beach once a week on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. And we're doing from 10 to 11, our 10 to 10.50 is uh, for stroke survivors. And then from 11 to 11.50 is another separate support group for caregivers um, by themselves. So we separate the two. Uh, and they like it that way. They would prefer not to have it together because that way they can talk about each other. Um, it works, but I want to make sure it's, and we're doing it all Zoom right now. And the Zoom isn't probably going to go away for a while. So there's no reason why you can't click in and join us if you'd like. Uh, um, so I will share that with Alina tomorrow when I get back onto my computer and uh, if she can put that up for us. Um, and maybe one of you would like to join us. Thank you. Yes, that's great. No, I, th I thank you all so much. I'm sorry, Elena. I just want to wish everybody a happy holidays and stay safe. Wear your masks, wash your hands, um, stay out of big groups. And uh, I'm really, I wish I could see your faces, but it was really nice to talk to you all tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Angie. I'll make sure um, everybody gets that information. Thank you so much. Okay. And Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Take Good care. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.